So what I would like to now talk about um, is a little bit of the mathematical preliminaries associated with data science. I'm assuming that people are seeing my slides change. Is this correct? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, unfortunately, I'm a little bit helpless here. Um, the what? Um, let me say. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to talk about it, again are some of the mathematical preliminaries, and one of them is uh, probability theory. Okay, and um, probability theory is something I'm assuming everybody here has had a probability course. I am certainly not going to teach any serious probability today because uh, you know basically you should have learned it in a course of a. Uh, uh, you know, of when you took probability. But I do want to remind us of some of the things about probability that we're going to be using in here. Um, and if we think about what probability is, probability is a theory is kind of, it's a formal area of mathematics, okay? Um, it's kind of associated with statistics, okay? But it's a different kind of a uh, beast. Probability theory gives us a framework to anal to reason about the likelihood of events. And um, the basic component is simply, you know, for a particular event or a particular outcome. Um, we talk about the probability of that outcome as a number. The properties of those numbers basically are that each probability is between zero and one. And the, um, what you call it, the, the sum of the probabilities over all possible outcomes is one. Um, now these are, you know, I think everybody knows this is the basic basics of probability. These properties are often um, not observed when people do data science in practice. And this is one you need to be aware of when you are using probability in a, in a, reasonable sense or if you're just you know using it to dress up a number that happens to be between zero and one what is an example of this um one and unfortunately if i had my my tablet which for some reason i am not connecting very well is um you know i think i can where did i have the power to annotate let's just look at it suppose let's say you're building a classifier you have um green things you have you know, let's say, uh, okay, well, let's say that you have, have uh, three different kinds of objects. Let's call them cars, trucks, and people. And you might want to build a system. Can people see the writing on, on the uh, video? Yes. Okay. So you might imagine trying to build a classifier whose job it is given an object to try to tell whether it's a car or a truck or a person. And I'm imagining some of you guys have had problems like this in the past. Has anybody here ever worked on a uh, project where they did multi-class classification? Okay, I see a couple people twitching. Does anyone want to admit it and tell me what they did? Uh, yes, I once had to build a um, multi-class naive Bayes classifier for uh, the MNIST data set. For the what? MNIST, MNIST data set. That, I think, means digits between zero and nine, right? Yes. And how did you do it? So this was, again, images, they're little images, and you want to tell, is it a zero or a nine? It's handwritten numbers, right? Yes. And what did you do to, to build that classifier? Uh, we made the assumption that it was uh, had an underlying distribution of a multivariate Gaussian, so we had to find the mean of each of the numbers or each of the sets of images for each digit, and then the covariance matrix for all of them. Okay, not sure I'm understanding all that yet, but um, did you build did you build one classifier for telling all the digits, or did you build ten classifiers, one for each di digit? I believe it, it ended up being just one, and that one okay. would output a problem. It would output the kind of person I want to talk to. Did anybody ever build a multi-class classifier where they basically built something they could tell, in this case, what was a car from trucks and people, and what was a truck from cars from people, and what was a person from cars and trucks? Did anybody ever build do multi-class classification? 
by building multiple such classifiers? Um, I did. Okay. And so when you did that, each classifier gave you a probability that it was a member of the same class, that class. Is that correct? Um, kind of, yes. What do you mean by kind of? It was, well, they were all vectors. They all appeared in vector space and you computed the similarity to determine whether or not they were associated with a class. Okay, so, so, so this demo has failed so far, but I think that, uh, that let, let me go back and try it again. A common thing to do would be to build a classifier that's going to, again, separate cars from trucks and people. A separate classifier that's going to separate trucks from cars and people. And a third classifier that's going to separate people from cars and trucks. And for each one of these, okay, if you use something like logistic regression or anything else like that, you will get a probability of what is the likelihood that it is a person versus not a person, okay? So my question really is, you often get a case that maybe you get something that the probability that it's a person is 0.5, the probability that it's a truck might be 0.7, and the probability of it being a car might be point, uh, let's say 0.3. Now let's say make that a 0.5 here, and make the probability of it being a person 0.1. I think your classifier is probably better at telling people from cars and trucks than anything else. If we had three classifiers, one of them said the probability of it being a car versus the others was 0.5. One of it was a um, truck was 0.7 versus the, not being a truck and a 0.1 of being a person. What do we think the object likely is? I think does everybody agree that that's probably a truck is the right call for it? Now, what's the probability of it being a truck? Okay, if you'll notice here, you've got three numbers for three different possibilities. Do those numbers add up to be one? If you have three independent classifiers, there's no reason why the numbers have to automatically add up to be one. Quite often, you can end up with a world where when you think about these things, you get numbers that are look like probabilities because they are um, adding, you know, they are between zero and one. But again, the second probability of a property of a probability is that they have to sum up over the uh, space of possible outcomes to one. How can we make this, the, turn these numbers into probabilities? Softmax? What was that? What was that? I used the softmax function. Uh, I, heard, I think I heard softmax function, is that correct? Yeah. So a softmax function is where you might take the probability, what's the probability of it being a truck? You might take something like e to the 0.7 and divide it by e to the uh, 0.5. I'm sorry about this being so slow, plus e to the 0.7 and plus e to the 0.1 right? If we do it this way, this is what people call the softmax function. This will normalize it so that the sum of these things, if you did the analogous thing for um, e to the 0.5, you know, 0.5 and e to the 0.1, the sum of those things will add up to be 1, okay? So softmax is a way of normalizing these probabilities. It's not the only way of normalizing those probabilities. Why do we use E as the base of the exponent here? Well, because people like using E, but there's no reason why it wouldn't work if you tried two instead of 2.718, okay? Or, in, or it wouldn't hurt if you, another way to normalize it might be just additively without raising them to powers, okay? Bottom line is probabilities are zeros, numbers between zeros and ones and the sums of uh, these, these, these things over all possibilities have to add up to, uh, what you call it, um, 
Hold on a second. Have to have to add up to be one. Any questions? Okay, I'm having technology problem. I got too cocky. Um, let me see. How do I turn this pen off? I can turn it into an eraser, but that isn't what I wanted. I'd like to be able to move on to my next item, and I can't do it. Uh, I am sorry about this, people, but let me see what I can do. Mouse, mouse. No. Okay, good. So let's try this. Let me now try to erase this, I guess. Sorry about that. Okay, boom. Okay, so what is the difference between probability and statistics? Again, probability is kind of, I will say, is a formal thing that, um, you know, is used to kind of predict the consequences of other um, things, you know, of, of future events, okay? Um, statistics is historically the area that um, deals with the analysis of past events. Statistics is from data you have. Those are past events, okay? Um, probability is a theoretical area of mathematics, okay, where you have these very formal definitions and you have consequences of these definitions, Statistics is, um, you know, what you call it, where we are trying to make sense of observations we have made in the past. And um, they are similar. They use similar tools in some ways, but, they, but, but understand that there's a difference between them. Um, okay, and let me just see if I can mouse. Boom. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that we learn to love in probability when we take a probability class is this idea of independent events, okay? So we say that the probability of, darn it, hold on. This is gonna be a long day, I can tell, okay? The probability of, um, uh, if you have events A and B, the probability of both of them happening, the intersection of the events, is the probability of A times the probability of B if they are independent. If half my class of my half my class is female and half the students in my class are above the median, what would be the probability that um, someone is both female and above the median? Okay? If these two things are independent, the probability of that should be the product of the two of them. That would mean a half times a half, and it would be a quarter. We liked independent events when we were studying probability because they made calculations easy. But independence is a bad thing for prediction, okay? Notice that I learned nothing about whether someone is likely to be above the median if they are, you know, if, if, if all these other factors were independent. Um, in general, we're gonna be interested in here more in conditional probability. The conditional probability, the probability that uh, of A given B is, again, what is the probability of event A given that we know that event B has satisfied? That is determined by the probability of both A and B tr uh, being true, A intersection B, divided by the probability of B. Um, conditional probabilities are what are interesting when it comes to making predictions, okay? The probability of A given B is kind of like, what's the probability that this thing is a car given we have an image B, okay? So being able to make predictions from data is really uh, 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 analogous to, to conditional probability, okay? If probabilities are, you know, all uh, events are independent, conditional probabilities are completely uninteresting. The probability of A given B is just a probability of A, okay? And so that's one reason why in here we're going to be thankful for um, conditional probability, because that's really what's necessary to, to have predictive powers. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, 
One important tool we will see from time to time in here is something called Bayes' theorem, which is a way of calculating um, conditional probabilities, okay, by in some sense reversing the direction of the dependency here. By Bayes' theorem, the probability of A given B is the probability of uh, uh, B given A, excuse me, is A given B times the probability of B divided by the probability of A. And I find this example here on four items, okay, to be actually fairly instructive. Uh, I will, um, actually, let me try to write on, on this thing again, although I am uh, terrified of that. Um, okay, let me try uh, draw, okay? What is the prob what is here the probability of B given A? If we look at this thing, there is B is the two right boxes. A are the first three boxes. The probability of A and B is only this four, the, the third box. Does everybody kind of see that? What is the probability of A? Some screaming would be good, actually. Um, what's the probability of A? Yeah, keep asking. Three quarters. A is three quarters. What's the probability of B? One half. One half. What's the probability of A given B? One by Okay. Well, if we know that it's B, it should be one half. Does everybody kind of see that? If we know it's B, it's one yeah. of this. Uh, it's, it's, you guys don't see my mouse cursor, do you? We do. You see my we mouse do see cursor? It. You can see it. see it. Okay, that's good to know then. Maybe we'll stick with the mouse cursor. There's two possibilities for A, um, for um, B, one of which is A. So what's the probability of A given B? That should be one half. So if we work through those, let, I'm going to do it on my paper because I'm afraid of writing on the screen with this. But what would this formula be? What's the probability of A given B? We said that's one half, right? What's the probability of B? We said that's one half. What's the probability of A? We said that that's three fourths. What does that work out to the probability of A given B, of B given A? It should be one fourth over three fourths, which is one third. Now, what is, look at the example. What is the probability of B given A? There are three boxes for A, one of which has a B, okay? That's um, Bayes' theorem in action. Any questions about it? Bayes' theorem is going to be interesting to us because sometimes it's easier. We have data on A, we, we care about the probability of, what's the probability of um, a, a, let's say, a class? What's the probability of something being a car? given data A. Sometimes it's easier to do that knowing um, what is the probability of this data given that it's a car. That gets into this naive Bayes thing that one of the students was kind of talking about. We'll go through that a little bit later. Any questions about Bayes' theorem? Um, Bayes' theorem is, is you know, it, is, it, uh, the proof is actually quite simple, although I, I always find that when I'm challenged to do it on demand, I don't get it right, okay? What is the key idea? The probability of, of, of something being both A and B is the prob clearly the probability of it being A and then the probability of it being B given A. Similarly, you could rewrite it in another way. The probability of something having both properties A and B is the probability it has property B and also has the, pro uh, uh, the property A, which would then occur with probability B, A given B. Thus, this is equal to that. We get two, uh, this thing on both sides. And by simply moving, multiplying, dividing both sides by the probability of B, we get Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem is easy to prove. It's an interesting consequence, and we will use it from time to time. Any questions about that?
Okay, good. Another thing about um, that, that are, let's say the basics of what we're gonna be wanting to do, is we're gonna be talking in here about random variables. What are random variables? They are numerical um, functions whose values come with probabilities. Again, if we think about it in the context of, you know, what's the probability of someone having a height between 6'3 and 6'4, okay? The random variable is height. Every height comes with a probability. More people are likely to be around, you know, the, you know, I'll say 5'7 than around 7'10 or 3 feet 6 inches, okay? So a random variable um, is often interpreted or thought of uh, uh, by sort of a histogram. The x-axis is the numerical range of the random variable. The y-axis is the probability. And a probability density function is a, um, basically shows what is the probability for each possible outcome of the random variable. What is the area under this um, probability density function? How much area is there under this? One. One, and we know that because again, the sum of the probabilities have to come up to be one. And what I show you here is the probability uh, density function of tossing two dice. If each dice, the sum of the two dice, each dice has a number from one to six on it. The highest number you can get is 12. The lowest number you can get is two. And, uh, but there are more ways to make seven than there are any of the other combinations. That's why you get a probability distribution like that. Any questions? Now, probability density functions, distributions, usually we will see them as PDFs. But there is another way to represent um, the, the uh, probability distribution associated with a random variable by something called the cumulative distribution function. The cumulative distribution function is the running sum of the probability density function as we go from left to right. The cumulative amount of probability on the leftmost is gonna be, of the cumulative distribution is gonna be zero. On the right side, the total probability is gonna be one because we've summed up over all kinds of outcomes, okay? And so we can represent the probability distribution associated by a um, random variable by either the PDF or the CDF. It should be clear they contain exactly the same information. One is simply the integral of the other. The other is the derivative of the integral. Any questions about that? Now, we will see reasons why cumulative distributions are sometimes very interesting to study. But, um, but sometimes for certain purposes, they can look misleading to you. Okay, this is Tim Cook, the, the leader of Apple, standing proudly before uh, his, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a conference bragging about iPhone sales. What does this graph show? Does this graph show you that iPhone sales have been exploding? Okay, certainly looks like it's going up. Can a cumulative distribution of anything go down? Okay, no. Okay, if you take a look at this particular sales thing and you instead plot the underlying sales each month, okay, in fact, at the time that he proudly stood before this thing, iPhone sales had dropped for two quarters in a row, okay, and you can't really see it because it's very, very hard to pick up on the, um, what you call it, the changes in a cumulative distribution. Any questions about that? Any questions about cumulative distributions or anything like that? Okay, bang, hold on, hold on. Bang, let me just set up something. Okay, good. Um, okay, what else can I tell you about? Um, I'd like to talk, a uh, now about um, sort of 
statistics, okay, descriptive statistics. The, um, the, the basic, you know, when we're given data sets, okay, what, you know, what is the first analysis one typically does of a data set, okay? I'm going to claim that one tries to figure out um, descriptive statistics to, to kind of capture what, um, you know, quickly capture some properties of the data set so we can understand it. And these um, descriptive statistics tend to fall into two main categories. They're what you would call central tendency measures. Basically, where is kind of the center of the distribution? And there are variability measures that measure how spread out the distribution is. And um, we have to be aware of um, both of these things uh, in order to uh, really understand what our distribution is. So what is the main central measure of the central tendency of a distribution? Okay. Um, I will say we will be talking about the mean. The mean, as all of you know, is the, um, what you call it, uh, you know, the, the summing up over, if you have a numerical set of values associated with, let's say, a random variable, summing up the values and dividing by n gives us an expected value, gives us a mean, okay? And the mean is a good central tendency measure of a, uh, what they say, a symmetric distribution without outliers, okay? Um, what is an example of something that is measured by a symmetric distribution with outliers? With, where there's, you don't expect that there's gonna be meaningful outliers. Does anybody have any variables in the universe where that is probably true? Uh, height and weight. Height and weight are classic things, right? There is an average height, I'll say five foot eight inches, okay? There is an average weight. I'm going to make it up and say 150 pounds, okay? And what's interesting about these distributions is that, um, again, there's typically about as many, if many people above this property, the mean, as there are below the mean, okay? That, um, that's what we mean by symmetric. Um, there are, uh, what you call it? Can anybody give me a um, example of a symmetric distribution that isn't symmetric? Let's start to think about things. What are, so, so and again, I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy I can't draw so well. We kind of believe that the distribution of height and weight would look something like, uh, okay, sorry about that, guys. I trust you guys are seeing bad things, right? Uh, okay, sorry, I can't really draw on this thing, but you guys know what a bell-shaped distribution looks like, okay? And you know about uh, height and weight would be like that. Can anybody come up with distributions that are not symmetric? Something in real life that probably isn't symmetric. Salary distribution. Salary data is a good example. Okay, what is the average salary? Okay, I don't know what the average, maybe the average person makes 50,000 a year. I don't know. But um, how many people make less than zero dollars per year? The answer is very, very few, right? Okay, um, and how many people make more than $100,000 a year? Well, hopefully all of you eventually, okay? So I certainly think that um, salary data is an example of where there are, um, it isn't symmetrical. Um, and are there outliers? Thinking about the salary data, are there outliers? Okay, certainly Jeff Bezos, is making unbelievable, you know, what is the difference between a Jeff Bezos and, um, and a Skeena? It's an unbelievable difference. What is the difference in height between uh, a Steven Skeena and let's say the, the, a big basketball star? Who's the, who's the tallest basketball star these days? I think it's Taco Fall. I don't know if anybody monitors basketball. 
The tallest person is probably about eight feet, okay, tall. Skiing is a runt under six feet, okay? But there's, so there's not that, you know, not that much very difference, really. But the number, you know, um, when it comes to something like wealth, there's people who are millions of times wealthier than other people, okay? And the mean starts to um, not be as suitable for those kind of distributions. The median is a better measure of central tendency, okay, for things like wealth and income, okay? When I did the calculation, you know, Bill Gates will add, um, what you call it, about $250 to the mean per capita wealth of everybody in the United States. But obviously you don't feel any richer because Bill Gates is in the country, right? The median, when it came to median, a starving graduate student and Bill Gates would offset each other and contribute basically nothing to change the median. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Um, one, oh, okay, fair enough. There's other notions of central tendency other than median. One of them is the, that's maybe um, interesting that some of you may have seen is the geometric mean. The additive mean is where you take the values and you sum them up, okay, and you divide by n. The geometric mean is where you take the product of the n elements and then take the nth root of it, okay? What is the geometric mean of n numbers, all of which are two? What is the geometric mean going to be? Two. Two, okay. So which is the same thing you would want on the additive mean. But the geometric mean has some other properties that are sometimes kind of interesting, okay? One is um, what happens to the, uh, the, the geometric mean I claim is always less than the arithmetic mean. Proving that is a little bit tricky, but um, that's one thing to keep in mind. What happens to a geometric mean when one element is um, zero? What happens to the geometric mean of all these items? It becomes zero, right? It, uh, it wipes it out. What is the analogous value that wipes out the meaning of an arithmetic mean? where the arithmetic mean becomes meaningless, something that's infinite, right? Okay, and uh, that's, that's where Bill Gates's wealth comes in or Jeff Bezos's wealth, that's a, approximately infinite. That's why you can't do these kind of things. Now geometric means, okay, turn out to be important, useful if you are trying to compute the average of ratios. Okay, so one terrible thing that people sometimes do is they get data that is in the form of ratios. What's a ratio? Let's say we want to figure out how much you eat today versus how much you eat tomorrow. That's a ratio, right? And if you ate the same amount as yesterday, it would be one. What if, what if you ate twice as much? Start out today, you eat one unit of food. Tomorrow, you double the amount of food you eat. So you eat two units of food. And then you go on, you say, no, no, that's bad. I'm only gonna eat half as much food as I ate yesterday, okay? Or half as much food before. What should be the average of ratios where I go from where I took the, I, I had food, I doubled it, and then I, ha I halved it, and then I doubled it? What should be kind of the average impact of having something and then doubling it? It should leave everything unchanged. Does everybody agree with that? And so if you average the ratios, you would like the average of ratios that involve having something and doubling it to leave it unchanged. Note that the arithmetic sum of one half and two is going to be greater than one. The geometric mean of one half and, and two is going to be one. 
So if you have data where you're, you're computing ratios, it's much more meaningful to compute the geometric mean of ratios rather than the arithmetic mean of ratios. Any questions about that? Generally speaking, a, a, a statistical sin is taking averages of ratios. Okay, any questions? Okay. Um, again, why do we do averaging and, and mean and things like that? These are ways of reducing, um, what you call it, uh, large groups of data sets to small single statistics. And these summary statistics are often useful features for things. Um, when you're given a data set that has a large number of clusters in it, lots of different populations, often one of the things you want to do is to reduce it to um, clusters so you could measure the properties of each group. Okay, and these statistics might be useful things. Okay, any questions about central tendency statistics? Those should be pretty pretty easy. Um, the other part of this that's that's important is um, the uh, measuring variance. Okay, measuring some level of of, of variation, and the standard um, measure of variance that we use is something called the variance or the standard deviation. The standard deviation, uh, sigma, okay, measures where we sum up over, um, what you call it, uh, all the elements in our data set. The difference of the squares, the square of the differences of each element from the mean. What is the, the, the consequence? Well, so first, x squared is going to be the mean of our x values we want to compute the variance of. Xi minus the mean is going to measure how much it differs from the, each element differs from the mean. What happens when we square that difference? What becomes interesting? Hold on. Okay. If oh, it's the positive. If it was positive or negative, the square of the differences are going to be all positives, right? So summing up the squares gives us a measure of how, how spread these elements are. Dividing it by n or n minus 1 gives us the average spread. The, the square root of that is the, um, what you call it, uh, what you call it, the square root of that is, um, what you call it, uh, you know, something we call the standard deviation. The square of the standard deviation is what we call the um, variance. Any questions about it? I'm sure you guys have seen it. Now, the one question that always comes up is when you see this variance formula, Sometimes you see it with a denominator of n minus 1, and sometimes a denominator of n. What is the difference here? And it has to do with, you know, in, in one sense, it doesn't make a difference. For any large value of n, n minus 1 and n are essentially the same thing. So in some sense, in general, for our analysis, it doesn't make any difference. Why do you see it? Well. If you want to get an estimate of the variance, or you want to understand the variance of a population, suppose we have an island with one person living on this island. And this person is, um, what you call it, has a, um, uh, what you call it, has a, a, weighs 150 pounds. How much variation in weight is there between the members of that on that island? There's only one person on that island. How much variance would we expect among the population of people on that island? Zero. We zero. want the answer to come out to be zero, right? What if, on the other hand, I want to say, you, 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 you say, oh, I want to understand the variance of the, um, you know, what you call it. Uh, I, I, I want to try to get an idea of how, what the variance of weight is. And I took one measurement, and this guy came in at 150 pounds. What should we know? If this was a sample, what do we really know about the variance of the underlying population 
if, if we only took one sample, it should be clear we don't know anything and we would want the variance to be infinite, okay? So n minus one will yield us infinite variance when n is gonna be one. And um, dividing by n would yield us zero variance when n was equal to one, okay? So the case of where you're really exhaustively doing the population, you divide by n, when you sample it, n minus one is the right thing. Any questions about that? Generally speaking, um, what you call it, the, uh, the, the uh, you know, for big N, it doesn't really matter, but presumably, usually you're gonna be dealing with statistical samples of things, so N minus one is the right thing to do. Any questions? Um, um, I understood that uh, when the population is only one, and so we should divide by N and N minus one, uh, I mean, that will be zero. Dividing by zero will be, doesn't make sense, but, uh, I really don't understand why we should do by n minus one when we're taking a sample, like five or six people from out of 20 people or maybe. Okay, why is that minus one? Okay, so we agree. Okay, so, so one argument, okay, so the argument that I gave for the idea that if you have a sample of one, you know nothing about the variance, makes sense to me why n minus one is better than, than, than n. Okay, the question of why, why is it exactly n minus one? Um, this, you know, on some level, you can interpret this as a convention. And on, again, all it is is a statistic. If you computed it with n minus two, could you compute it and get a number? The answer is yes. It wouldn't be called the standard deviation, okay? As we will see, there are properties of the standard deviation that are useful. Okay, and presumably they are useful because they work out with the n minus one. Okay, any questions? So the generalization would still work in big cases. And that's why we could uh, take it as n instead of n minus one, right? So you could take it, for, for the, the difference is that when you divide something by a, a million versus dividing something by a million and one, the result doesn't change very much. So that means that you could be sloppy and use the wrong thing and no one's gonna know. For small values, it might very well show up as a bigger, more meaningful difference, okay? So but that's- yes, The question kind of is, N minus one is the definition of sample variance, okay? And that's what kind of people use and build theories, theorems around for why they use uh, variance. So in this case, you're saying that when we take the sample, the number will be small enough that the minus one would matter. So we are trying to keep stick with well, minus whether, one. Whether it matters or not, the convention is to use the, um, what you call it, the, 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 the N minus one, okay? So okay. I see no reason not to use N minus one. And convention or not. Sample, that's the right way to do it. Convention or not though, like, isn't the goal usually to get like a better representation of your data? So like, despite convention, why, like if, if N minus one isn't actually better if it's just by convention, that's- Okay, so why do we use the variance? Let, let's now show you where the power is, okay? We could, you, you could say, we'll, we'll create a Skeena deviation where we say N minus 17, okay? And that's a statistic, fine. But where is an example why, um, why is it that, that getting the variance calculation right, okay, is valuable? It's because as calculated by the N minus one and the idea of the mean, um, the variance and the uh, mean capture properties of, of the statistical distribution in a well-defined way. And let me talk about that in a second. Um, so, for ex uh, okay, so if you take a look at a distribution, forget about the N minus one for just a minute, okay? When I buy printer cartridges, okay, you could imagine, you know, when you, when you have a printer, some of you have had a computer printer in your life, you've had to buy cartridges for it. Any printer cartridge lasts for a certain amount of time, okay? Um, you could imagine that printer cartridges by a manufacturer 
they will typically tell you it will last an average of, I can't read my slide, I think it said 3,000 copies, okay? You can imagine two different kinds of probability distributions. What's the number of copies your cartridge is likely to answer? If it averages to 3,000, you might have the thing on the left, which is a symmetric, you know, normal like curve. Or if you're like me, I think that the evil printer cartridge people have counters. And the moment that the cartridge exceeds the limit that they guaranteed, they will refuse you to use the, um, what you call it, use you to the, um, what you call it, to, to, to make another copy. If so, in this distribution, the number of copies from the from your cartridge is always going to be three thousand. In another, it's going to be an average of three thousand, but spread around. Together, the mean and the standard deviation characterize the distribution well. Okay. Um, any questions? It's obvious on the uh, evil distribution, the variance is extremely small. In the other distribution, the normal looking distribution, the distribution, you know, there is a certain measurable variance there. Now, if you, what, what's important about getting the, you know, variance or the standard deviation computed properly is that there are theorems about uh, that, that use uh, the standard deviation as we have defined. And um, one of the important properties is that no matter how your data is distributed, at least one minus one over k squared of, of, the, of the points of the values of the probability mass has to lie within k sigma uh, of the mean. What does that mean? Sigma is the standard deviation, right? You could imagine a world, let me, at the risk of this, try to draw again, okay? You can imagine, well, let, let's go back, let's go back to this thing. Let's see if I can draw, okay? Here we have um, the, never mind, we don't have that. Okay, let's go back. Sorry about that. Um, let's try to draw a distribution. And I'm going to try to for next time to figure out why I am not having why I'm having this problem. Um, what must I do? Why am I not being able to draw? Let's say uh, draw. Okay, this this I am uh, angry about. Okay, let me do something really dumb. Can anybody see this distribution? That's a distribution, right? Here we have got the mean. There is going to be a standard deviation. Let's call it sigma. We can measure mass, that is, at, this, is this is minus sigma, minus two sigma, minus three sigma, sigma, two sigma, three sigma, does everybody see that we can interpret the values of every number as being the mean plus or minus a certain number of standard deviations from the mean, right? The standard deviation here, remember, was the square root of the sum of the variances. I'm gonna argue that this is probably about what the size of the standard deviation of this distribution is. What is this theorem that I'm staying here? If I want to know how much mass lies within two standard deviations of the mean, that would mean going from here to here, okay, I will claim that no matter how the data is distributed, you must have at least one minus one over k squared of the points must lie within k sigma of the mean which means that at least 75% of the probability mass, one minus one over the, um, what you call it, the, uh, uh, if we're within two standard deviations, K is two, K squared one minus one fourth, 
is three fourths. This says that three fourths of the probability must lie within two standard deviations of the mean. So if I know the mean and the standard deviation of any distribution, I know where most of the mass actually is. Okay? And that tells me something about the distribution. Any questions about it? Now, Isn't this only true for um, Gaussian distributions? The answer is it is not true. It is not only true. Well, okay, so first of all, this is true for every distribution. This is weaker than the assumption about Gaussian distributions. We'll talk about normal distributions in a few weeks, okay? But think about what this means. This means that there is no way you can put a lot of mass far from the mean in any distribution where we mean far from the, the, the mean relative to the standard deviation. If you think about it, what if you try to do it? What if you try to build a distri probability distribution where you have a big hump here and a big hump there? Does everybody see that on this di th distribution, there's no mass at the mean, there's a lot of mass all the way to the left, far to the left and far to the right, but what's going to be the, very, the standard deviation of this distribution? Is it going to be large or small? It's got to be large, right? And so if you just take a look at it, how much standard deviation, how much mass, could you come up with one where the standard deviation is one? Okay, how much mass could you put away with it, where, where the standard, where everything is one standard deviation away? It turns out a distribution where you put all the mass at minus sigma and plus sigma, okay? This is possible, okay? And that if you put half the mass at a distance minus one and half a distance of, of plus one, at plus one, the standard, the, st the standard deviation is gonna be one. In this case, if you look at it within one standard deviation of the mean, if K was one, one minus one over one zero of the points could possibly lie within one standard deviation. But there's no way to put more mass further, you know, further away without creating the standard deviation higher. So the interesting thing is that if you get given, a ma given the, the mean and given the standard deviation, Together, you get um, a, a reasonable approximation of any, um, what you call it, uh, of any kind of distribution. Any questions about that? Okay. How do you prove this? Okay, this would be, I, I think this is probably relatively elementary algebra, just about the fact that you can't put, I mean, how would you have proved this in the first place? It's a question of, what does the standard deviation mean? It's the sum of the squares of the differences of things. If the variance is such, you would argue that there has to be a certain amount of mass that has to be outlying that. That's not really a proof, I'm fumpering around. But it should be pretty clear that, um, that in order to get um, a lot of mass far from the mean, that implies that you have a large variance. And this theorem is simply just demonstrating what the trade-off between the two of them are. Any questions about that? Is there an upper bound too? Is what? So is there like um, a maximum number of points that are within k sigma of the mean? Is there a maximum number of points that are within k sigma of the mean? Well, if this much of the mass is within k sigma of the mean, at most, one minus that is the mass that can be more than k sigma of the mean. Okay, I don't know if that's answering what you said. Oh, I kind of asking the reverse, which is asking, like, because you said for any distribution that at least one minus one over k squared has to be within a certain number of sigmas. Is there like some kind of proof that says you can't have more than a certain amount? Um, I, okay, I don't know about it, but it stands to be reasoned. There's consequences that, you know, if you have, um, 
again, if you have variance, it means that you've got things that are differing. The sum of that, that variance is basically the sum of squares differences. Okay. To have variance, you've got to have a certain amount of sum of square differences. You can now think about extreme old cases of where do you put the mass? Okay. And I think that that, you know, something like that would, um, you know, would tell you about what you're trying to say about. The upper bound is all of them because you could have all the data stacked on top of each other at one place. Like on the polls that I was showing you before, right? Yeah, but just, just one mode instead of two. Okay, if you have one mode, it's all sitting on the, you have a world where there's no variance. Right, or, or, or a very tiny amount of variance will also work. Okay, so anyway, this is what governs. The important point here is that once you know the mean and the, and the standard deviation, you know a lot about what the shape of your uh, distribution is. Any questions about that? Okay, what I'd like to um, do for the rest of class, though, is to try to give you some idea of um, what it is to interpret variance. And again, um, you know, yes, we know how to plug it in a calculator. We can, you, you, you argue with me about n minus one or n, but one way or another, calculating it isn't that hard. But seeing that, that data has variation is one of the things that people are not very good at. Um, you know, I have been, you know, these days we're in the day of COVID. The New York Times has this great website that will tell me how much uh, many COVID cases there are in Suffolk County each day, okay? And I'm worried, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What's happening? What does that distribute that data do? Okay, that data does something like go up and down. Okay, one day it goes up, one day it goes down. Okay, sometimes for two or three days in a row, four, three or four days in a row, and maybe it looks like it's going up. How do you tell whether or not something is going up or if you're just talking about random jiggling? Okay, and this is something people are not very good at doing. Um, it's often very hard to measure, you know, what is signal versus noise. Because when you see a data set, sometimes what you're really just seeing is variance. Okay, um, you know, when it comes to the COVID cases, um, fewer, when you look at the New York Times data, every, every Sunday, Okay, there's, there's fewer people die of COVID than any other day of the week. Why is that? Is that people are looking, for, you know, uh, people enjoy the weekend. What is it? It's probably a statistical reporting problem, not something that's with, with the patients themselves when they're dying. Okay. But in a lot of things in life, you see numbers go up and down, and it's very, very easy to misinterpret what that, what that actually means. And the classic example is the stock market, okay? Um, you have a lot of different mutual, the time will come when you will have money and you will invest that money. And you will invest it probably in some kind of a mutual fund where there is some kind of a manager who claims to know about the stock market and what stocks you should buy and what ones you shouldn't. Um, well, one thing that they find is that when they, um, you would think that if some investor, every year there is going to be one investor who does best, okay? Um, the, uh, but when you look at investors year to year, people find that their performance goes up and down, okay? And it's very, very difficult to tell whether the difference in the quality of an investor relative to their peers is that they are better than their them, or that you're simply measuring over a short period of time, and that the fluctuation in performance is essentially random. In general, they have done a large number of studies, okay, of investors. And every year, some do better than others, but very, very few investors consistently do well relative to their peers, okay? And that's because Again, there's a lot of variance in performance, and it may be that there's very little difference in skill between investors. Any questions about it? It's hard to see what's going on because there really is variance there. 
Um, hold on. Sorry about this. Okay. I am um, a baseball fan, as I think I've already confessed to, to some of you. And one of the measures in baseball that is um, uh, important is uh, somebody's batting average. When someone is, is, is a batter, they get up, they, they, they uh, hit, and they try to get a hit, and either they get a hit or they make out. Um, and a good baseball, a, a star baseball player is one who can hit 300 meaning that they get at, hits 30% of the time, okay? That whenever they get up, 30% of the time they get hit, 70% they make out. If you can do that, you're a star hitter. Now, what happens when you have a hitter, okay, who bats, let's say, 275? 275 means 27.5% of the time they get a hit. This person is not considered to be a star, okay? And somebody who gets 332, who bats three, 325 or gets hits 32.5% of the time. These things are, um, that person's considered a superstar. Now, baseball seasons last for a long time. The, the typical star might, batter might get up 500 times. The interesting thing is that if you flip a coin that's going to come up heads 30% of the time, if you flip it 500% of the time, 10% of the time you're going to get less than 27.5% uh, heads, and 10% of the time you're going to get more than 32.5% heads. If you flip a coin 500 times and you get uh, you know, and you get an unusual number of heads. Is that because you're good at flipping coins or you just got lucky? Okay, I will say in the coin situation, you just got lucky. In general, if you're a batter that really would hit with a 30% success rate, the observed results over a period of time is going to be a distribution. And under this model, you're just as likely to hit badly, okay, 275, as you are to hit sensationally. Now, if somebody has a baseball season and they hit sensationally, much better than they usually do, what are they going to say? Are they going to say, I got lucky that year? Or are they going to find some other explanation for what happened? Okay. Typically, they'll say, oh, I worked out really hard over the season, past season. I had great concentration. I was really good, okay? So, again, recognize that in any kind of an observed process, there is going to be variance. And a lot of the performance difference you see in baseball players does not necessarily reflect real results, okay? It reflects what you observe, okay? When you guys get to take a test and you do much better than you usually do, is that because you got you 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 prepared better, or is that because you got lucky? Okay, it's very hard to tell these things because variance is kind of like a force in the universe that you know makes it hard to interpret these things. Any questions? Another case where in this class where you're going to, many of you are going to misinterpret variance. How many of you have at some point done some kind of machine learning where they, well, whether you've done it or not, maybe isn't necessary. You're going to use Python libraries, okay, to compute machine learning models. And many libraries will give you many different, several different machine learning algorithms that you can run on your data. Right? Maybe you're trying to build a classifier to try to tell whether or not, um, what you call it, uh, you're trying to build a classifier to try to tell whether or not, um, you know, something is a car or a truck. Maybe using linear regression, you get a power, you get an accuracy of 96.2. Maybe using SVMs, you get an a accuracy of 91.5. 
Typically, what people will try to do is to take a, 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 a uh, machine learning problem and run it through several different machine learning algorithms, run it through with several different parameters on these machine learning algorithms. And what's going to happen when you run your data through 100 machine learning models? One of them is going to perform best on your training data and on your testing data. Is that going to be the best model overall? Well, not necessarily. There is a certain level of variance here, okay? A lot of the difference that you observe between the performance of different machine learning algorithms represents relative chance kinds of things, more, more variance than it is you know, necessarily real performance, more noise than signal, okay? And so one thing we have to be aware of is what the, you know, is looking out for what is, you know, what kind of things are, are explainable by, uh, I'll argue, random chance, okay? And things we can try to do to select models and select things that are more robust to this kind of thing. Typically, if you have a bunch of models, or at least when I have something, if I have a, a problem I care about, and I've got a lot of models to try to solve that problem, I don't necessarily pick the one that is, gives me the best result on my test set. I typically try to predict, take the simplest model that does well. Okay, the simpler model I picture is more likely to be robust, less likely to be overfitting, less likely to have random chance associated with it. Okay, so I guess the, the, the lesson here is to recognize that variance is this phenomena that happens. Okay, and that uh, we should recognize it comes up in data sets and in most processes people do. And learning to recognize when something is is variance versus signal is an important thing. Any questions about that? Professor, so is there a recommended size of hypotheses set to test at once without fishing for correlation? Okay, so one question is, I think what the question is getting about is, is if so much of what you observe in data is um, what you call is due to variance and noise, how do you know when a model really is any good, okay? How do you know whether you've really kind of, there is, whether there are good investors versus random investors, okay? Um, this is where we get into statistical testing. And we will talk about statistical testing, you know, a few weeks, you know, a few lectures from now. But that's why it actually matters. Because a lot of things that are, that are true in the world, or, the, or when, when we see, observations of things it's often very complicated to know what it's really saying and whether it's really saying anything statistical tests are what are the um the, the tool to try to tell us how confident are we in the results of our you know of, 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 of our interpretation of what we're actually seeing any questions Okay. Um, if not, I think I'm going to end it here. Next class, um, we're going to go do a uh, Python uh, review.